Well, hello and welcome to another guest interview here on the Profit With Law podcast. I'm your host, Moshe Amsel, and today I have a treat for you. And I say that often on this podcast because we have such amazing guests that come on here. But uh, today we have uh, an author of a newly released book, came out in January. Uh, the name of the book is Second in Command. And when I saw the book, I told my team, I said, hey, we need to get this guy on this on our show because this is something that's so important for our audience when you're in the the growth of your business uh, what ends up happening is is that you start to hire people to solve problems and you put people in place to take over functions that you are owning as the founder and owner of the business uh, but at some point you need somebody to manage that for you to make sure that things are happening to take the the ownership of the management layer off of your plate and there's no better person to come to the conversation today than cameron harold uh who is the author of second in command and founder of the coo alliance Cameron's the mastermind behind hundreds of companies, exponential growth, and has earned his reputation as the business growth guru. He has built a dynamic consultancy with clients that include a monarchy and a big four wireless company. I can't wait to learn more about that. The author of six books, Cameron is also a top-rated international speaker, having spoken on all seven continents. The founder of the COO Alliance, the world's leading network for seconds in command, he's also the host of Second in Command, the Chief Behind the Chief podcast, love that name, where he interviews COOs and the other second and other seconds to share their insights with his listeners. Cameron, welcome to the show. Hey, Moshe, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. It's my absolute pleasure. And when I start off, I you know I I like to make it really easy for you. Um, our listeners don't know who Cameron Harold is. Some of them may, um, but they're really curious to know who you are, not just, oh, the author of a book or the, you know, the person who's, you know, um, helped a monarchy or top four wireless, uh, you know, grow their business. Um, who are you as a person? Give us a little bit of, of, of a background about around you and, and how you ended up becoming the, the guru behind the uh, COOs. Sure. Um, Canadian kid grew up in Northern Ontario in Canada. I grew up in a family of entrepreneurs where my father was an entrepreneur and both sets of grandparents were entrepreneurs. And all through growing up, the entire time I was in school, I was always told to be a lawyer. And I was like, I liked law. I love the idea of law, but I wanted to be an entrepreneur. But I ended up doing my undergraduate degree in law. Um, so I've got a bachelor's degree with a law major, which is the only one of its kind in Canada. Um, so I studied all kinds of great you know, areas of law. I know enough to be dangerous, but not enough to practice. So I, I'm not allowed to practice law, but I, I was able to study it. And um, but started running my own company when I was 20 years old. When I was 12 years or when I was 20, I had 12 full time employees working for me and ran my own business pretty much from that point on. I got involved with a number of businesses um, throughout my career, built out what became the largest collision repair chain in the world. I was a partner in the franchising side of what's now called Gerber Auto Collision in the US and Boyd Auto Body in Canada. I was the second in command for a company, 1-800-GOT-JUNK. We, I took that company from 14 employees to 3,100. I'm a father of two boys. I've got two kids that are 20 and 22 years old. Um, I'm married, super happily married, traveling the world with my wife. We sold everything a couple of years ago and we live globally. So I'm actually talking to you right now from Spain and our next uh, next little trip is off to Iceland. So we just spend the time backpacking and traveling, exploring the world. That's a little bit about me. That's really amazing. What were the, the what was the age range of your kids again? Twenty two and twenty. I've got I've got kids in that age bracket too. As a matter of fact, uh, two of my daughters are getting married in August. They've decided oh. to give me a double whammy and get married at the same time. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, but uh, really, it's really cool the stage of life that you're in and being able to just uh, be able to you know travel wherever you want and and uh man one eight one eight hundred got junk that's no joke uh really really decent uh decent sized business and I'm sure there's there's a story there uh what I want to do is I want to jump right into the COO conversation uh sure. our audience is primarily law firm owners that are trying to uh trying to get from six to seven figures or seven figures to multi seven figures. That's really the bulk of the of the listeners. So 
some of them may not even have an employee yet, but a lot of people have, uh, you know, as I mentioned in the intro, like they've, they've hired a legal assistant, they've hired a law clerk, they've hired a receptionist, they maybe even they hired some, an associate or two. Um, but they don't have somebody who's taking responsibility for the operations of the business. Yeah. How, how do you even begin to go about to figure out if you're ready for that? It's interesting. And, and this is, by the way, a very similar situation to doctors, um, chiropractors, um, dentists, you know, a lot of the engineers, architects, a lot of the very, very smart, um, very kind of university accredited, um, well-educated individuals come out with their degree and they're really, you know, they spent 10 years, six years getting, getting to that level, but no one's ever taught them how to run a company. And now they're expected to build a law practice or a dental practice or a doctor practice or a chiropractor, like, and no one's ever taught them how to run a business. So really it's time to pivot and think of the expertise that you have as always good enough but the new expertise that we need to get is how do we build a company, right? How do we build an entrepreneurial company? So it's all about studying entrepreneurial organizations and not studying the big companies, right? If you're a single practice, single person practitioner law firm, or, and you want to build one out, or you're a smaller firm with a few employees and you want to scale it up, start reading books and studying books and studying businesses that are in that entrepreneurial space and learn what they've done. The starting point, the way that you know that you have to, to hire someone is if you're working on a lot of areas of the business that drain you of energy, right? If you're working on a lot of the areas of the business that you're just not good at, right? Um, and then think about how much money you're earning in your practice. Let's say that you're earning 250,000 a year being a lawyer, you know, doing whatever. Uh, that's effectively $125 an hour. Why are you working on minimum wage jobs, right? If you reported to me as an employee, if I hired you, and we're paying you $250,000 a year, I'd be pissed off at you doing $15, $20 an hour jobs. So the first thing is to get a lot of the administrative off your plate. And it doesn't have to be by hiring full-time people. So you can start by hiring an executive assistant or a fractional executive assistant. Um, it can be somebody within the law space, but it can also be somebody from outside of the legal industry who can just help you with a lot of the admin and the, the basic parts of helping to scale up the business some of the early stage marketing, some of the early stage networking, um, handling appointments, whatever it's going to be, right? Things that are draining you of energy or time. The second part is you'll get to a stage where you realize you're working on the stuff that is definitely at your pay grade, but you're not able to focus on growth. You're not able to focus on scaling up the business. That's when the first kind of strategic hires start coming into place and you start having to, to kind of build out around there. Yeah, I love that differentiation between, you know, what are you, what are you spending your time on? And as long as you're spending your time on those low level tasks, that's really an indicator that you need to hire somebody to do those tasks, not necessarily to oversee it. But once you're actually elevated into the role that you should be in and still you can't focus on where do you go next, that's when that's when it's really time. So well, and the second part of that, and it's funny, I hear entrepreneurs all the time doing this entrepreneurs complain about all the parts of the business they hate. And I step back, I'm like, but you report to yourself. Like if you hate it so much, hire someone to do it or stop doing it or outsource it or delegate it or optimize it or automate it, right? But you don't, because you run the company, you can rig all the rules in your favor. You're allowed to delegate everything except genius. And some of that genius might not be law anymore. You might all of a sudden wake up and go, you know what, I like law but it doesn't necessarily fuel me and fire me up. I've, I've actually coached and worked behind the scenes coaching four good sized law firms, one that had about a $10 million a year advertising budget as a law firm. So I was coaching their CEO and their second command. And in fact, the four law firms I've coached have all had about three to, to $10 million ad budgets. They run real companies, but none of those lawyers actually practice law anymore. At some point, they decided they wanted to be an entrepreneur more than they wanted to be a lawyer, and their product or their service happened to be law instead of a pizza hut, you know, a pizza parlor or a, you know, marketing business. They decided their product or service was going to be law. So it's just you deciding as an entrepreneur now what areas of the business fire you up, what areas of the business fuel you, what areas of the business are you really good at, and how do you delegate everything except genius? 
You know, it's interesting because some of the most successful attorneys that I know, um, as far as growing their own practice, started out or or quickly morphed into a partnership where they were running the business and their partner was doing the the legal side of it. Yeah, uh, Seth, Seth Seth Price, uh, the founder of Blue Shark Digital. Uh, who graces our stage at the Law Firm Growth Summit every year and has been on the podcast multiple times is a perfect example. He's got a you know a, a large DC firm, uh, well known. Uh, Price Benowitz. Uh, I don't know the rest of the name if there's any more to it, but um, and he hasn't practiced law in over 20 years. Yeah, but, I've I've spoken to Seth Price and I didn't even realize he was the lawyer side of the marketing firm that focuses on law, law firms. Yeah. Uh, another another great example. I, I coached a guy named Seth Bader from Bader Scott in Atlanta, and they've got a you know five million dollar a year ad budget, 150 employees. Well, Louis Scott runs the business, and Seth Bader is kind of the visionary in the marketing and the biz dev side of things. But neither one of them practice law anymore, but both of them are lawyers. Yeah. So uh, your your case is your case is is in point is taken uh is taken well. And I think that. Um, we can look throughout the marketplace at examples of attorneys who have uh, stopped practicing law to run the business or even given up law to change their business into something that's not even a practice anymore. Uh, there's a guy, Bobby Klink, who I've had on the podcast, who I know really well, I actually use his stuff um, that has created a uh, legal template business for online entrepreneurs. And he's running a multi-million dollar business just selling legal templates. As a matter of fact, right now, they're in the middle of developing software to um, uh, implement AI to give legal answers to entrepreneurs so that they can just put a question in and it matches the question with a, a the an appropriate type question where they're given they're given an answer that was actually written by an attorney. So yeah. the AI is not trying to give the legal responses; it's just trying to match the question with the right answer uh, to provide for that question. It's really cool stuff. Uh, but the sky's the limit with what you want to do. You just have to figure out what you're good at, what light what fires you up, and what you're excited about. Um, and like you said, like you 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 set the rules of this game um, and and you get to decide how you play it. Well, at the end of the day, every company, whether it's a law firm or a dental practice or a pizza parlor, we have three resources. We have our people, we have time and we have money. And our job is to get the highest return on investment of those three things. So if you wake up in the morning one day and say, hey, I love marketing, I'd, I'd rather run a marketing agency, then yeah, maybe you become Bill Hauser who runs the SMB team and Bill's got, you know, 150 ish marketing uh, clients, but all of his clients are law firms. Bill's a lawyer, but he decided he wanted to be a marketing firm more than a law firm at one point. Yeah. Um, and Bill Hauser, another, uh, another person who, who graced our stage at the law firm growth summit. If you want to get on the wait list for our next event, go to lawfirmgrowthsummit.com. Um, so here's the next question. I know that I need a COO or yeah. in, in, um, in the in the words of traction and integrator, um, you know, that's that's often thrown around a lot. Uh, sure. I know that I need that second in command. I think need that person to to handle uh, the the responsibility of the operations of the business. How do I determine the skill set needed? The type of person I want? Like like where where does somebody even begin to figure out the right person that they're looking for for that role? It's a great question. And it's interesting. So Bill Hauser's second in command is a guy named Brandon, who's a member of the CO Alliance. And then, you know, Seth Bader's second in command, Luis, the member, and then Jason Hennessy from Hennessy Digital, his second in command is a member of the CO Alliance. All three of those COOs would be horrible COOs for the other person's company, right? Scott Shrum would be horrible running Bill's company and, and Brandon would be horrible running Seth's company. The starting point is understanding yourself as the CEO or the entrepreneur first. Secondly, it's understanding the stage of growth that your company is in, right? The season that you're in. And then it's finding that second in command who matches you as a person and matches the needs of your company at the stage of growth that your company is in right now. So even when I was the second in command for 1-800-GOT-JUNK, I was the right person for the season from the 2 million to 106 million but the wrong person to take them from 100 million to the billion. So it's about understanding yourself. So it's really doing an inventory of 
me as an entrepreneur, right? Or whoever's listening right now, what are the parts of the business that you love working on day to day? What are the parts of the business that feed you with energy? What parts of the business are you really, really good at? And then kind of counter to that, what parts of the business drain you of energy? When you wake up in the morning, what parts just like, oh, I don't want to have to work on that right now. What parts of the business do you suck at? And you're going to start looking for a second in command who is really good at all of the things that drain you and that you're not good at. Now, this, the next part of this is to think about the stage of the company that you're in, right? Are you a, a big firm looking for a big corporate person or are you a small entrepreneurial firm trying to figure it out as you go, right? If you're a one person or a five person company, you're looking for a very different second in command than a 150 person company. You're also looking for a second in command with a different title and probably a different compensation package. Right. So I call it a second in command more than a COO because it could be a vice president of operations. It could be a director of operations. It could be a general manager or it could be a COO. Just like the head of your finance group could be a controller or a director of finance or a VP of finance or a CFO. So be careful with thinking you're recruiting a COO when really you're recruiting a second in command. And just because they've been a COO or a second in command for another law firm doesn't mean they'd be a good fit for you. It could be a different style of, of founding C, you know, CEO. It could be a, like a, a John Barry from Barry Law, who's very like driven, type A, former military, you know, don't fuck around. Like, um, or it could be a very kind of quiet, um, amiable George Sink, who is very you know, polite, God forbid you would ever swear anywhere near George and John Barry's dropping an F-bomb every 15 minutes or, or seconds, right? So you have to understand the style of the com kind of company and who you're bringing somebody in as well. Yeah, I love that um, that you share that just to, to kind of recap. So basically the COO is complimenting the CEO and wherever the CEO is lacking, the, the COO needs to shine. Um, right. And that and and the other the other thing that I heard that you said, and I just want to lean into for a moment is we don't have to call them a COO. Uh, a lot of people are afraid of, oh, my gosh, if I hire somebody who's a COO, I, I don't think I can afford that. Um, but the reality is, is what if you just call them an office manager? Right. And, well, you know, here's, here's the other one. If you don't have an executive assistant, you are one. Right. So the first hire you need before you hire a COO is an executive assistant. And then, yeah, probably an office manager or a project manager or an operations manager, a, a person that you can delegate a lot of stuff to. So here's how you know what the title should be. The title that you give the second in command, whether it's an office manager or an operations manager, or a director of ops, whatever, the title is based on the compensation, right? How much you're willing to pay them. It's tied to the roles and responsibilities that they have. The more strategic insight they bring in, the higher the title will be. The more P&L responsibility they have, the higher the title will be. Right. If you're going to hire a COO, they better have full access to all of the banking and, and financial statements and know everything about the business. If you're not willing to give them that, they're probably more like a director level. If they're going to need a lot of oversight from you and it's command and control and you're going to be delegating and following up, that's probably a more junior operations person. But if it's a person where you can just say, hey, here's where we're going. Show me how to get there. That's probably a more senior person. Right. So it's all based on roles and responsibilities, strategic insight, P&L responsibility, the level of management oversight that they need, and how much you're willing to pay. Okay, so now let's say I decided I'm getting a COO. I figured out what the what the type of person is I'm looking for. Uh, I go out in the marketplace. I miraculously find the right person. How do you deal with um, separating the... CEO who tends to get an idea in the shower in the morning and come into the office and say, hey, we're doing this. And it's like an about face from what we were doing the day before to yeah. the COO whose job it is to make sure that we stay on track with our goals and our projects and responsibilities that we set out to. Uh, how do you deal with that dynamic when you haven't had it before? And now you've got somebody who maybe is pumping the brakes for you or, uh, or you know, doing a check, a check in to try to, to, to make sure that you're not blown up the company after you just made a you know a smart move the day before 
it's evolving as a leader. It's it's you as a leader evolving and, and growing and, and getting better skills at, at being able to lead, not manage, at being able to you know, align and inspire versus hold accountable. I was asked by Fortune Magazine 20 years ago, how do you hold your employees accountable? I said, I don't, I hire accountable people, right? So, I mean, you're, you're a dad, you've got two daughters that are getting married this summer. Do you, do you teach your daughters how to pour orange juice in the morning and tell them to make their bed and put their clothes away? Of course not. Not anymore. Like, <laughs> you, you I did that you, at some point. Do you buckle up their seat belts in the car for them before you drive away? Of course not. Well, be, that's because they've grown, right? And then your job as a dad has had to evolve as well. Well, that's very similar to our job as a, as a leader in a company. When your company is very small, it's very much command and control. Here's what we're doing. Go get it done. You, you know, you're showing people what needs to get done. You're often showing people how to do it because there's nobody else around to do that stuff. But as the company scales, you start to move through that zone and then your job is more aligning people and growing people and recruiting people and inspiring people and getting the heck out of their way. It's just an evolution that we need to go through as a leader. And it's a skill that we need to get better at. Yeah, I love that. And so when somebody brings in a second in command, um, what what are I what are some good ways to hold them accountable or to give them the 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 right expectation for what's expected of them? Like how do you set the the bar on on their report card? So again, it, it depends on the, the stage of the company and it depends on the stage of person you're bringing in, right? If you're hiring a COO or a director of operations, they need more oversight. So you're not going to hold the COO accountable. They'll hold themselves accountable, but you might hold the director of ops accountable or an operations manager accountable. So it starts with the, the level that you're hiring for. For any, any of those roles, you're going to give them a scorecard. The scorecard are the five core parts of the business that they're responsible for running this year and what initiatives they need to put in place by the end of this year and what metrics they're going to be measured on, right? Or what metrics they're responsible for ensuring get better. That's really the starting point. In addition to that, you're going to show them the behavioral traits that you need them to exhibit, right? Uh, outside of that, it's just living the core values. And that's consistent regardless of title. So, um, and this is more specific to law firms. And I don't know if you've come across this. So I'm going to ask it. But if you haven't been exposed to it, then that's fine. Sure. Um, but presumably somebody who's at the COO level, they're, they have access to the finances. They're really, they're really steering, steering the ship for the law firm. Uh, they would want to be compensated off of their own performance, right? Uh, so when you start looking at profit sharing or percentage of revenue, percentage of profit, stuff like that, uh, one of the nuances that law firms have to worry about is the fact that I'm not allowed to uh, perhaps have a a uh, percentage of of the legal services go to a non attorney. Um, there, you know, there are ethical rules around how to structure that. Have you have you come across that? And what kind of uh, uh, cool ideas have you come up with to work around that? I'd say no, I haven't I haven't bumped into that specifically, but the area that I think is is important for every founding CEO or founding you know lawyer to consider when they're building out their firm is what specifically are you trying to build? Are you trying to build the economic value of your firm so that you can sell it in a few years? Are you trying to build the profit of the business so that you can pull more cash off the table to invest in real estate and have a better life? Are you trying to build a firm that has a bunch of people doing stuff for you so that you have all the free time to just sit and, and you know, run your hobbies and show up four hours a day? So it's really first and foremost, what is it you're building? Why are you building it? And how do you align your team to make sure that they're building that for you? And then how do you compensate them based on what, what you know, you're building for? Because not every business is trying to build for growth. Not every business is trying to build for profit. So to have a profit sharing plan in place, if your entire vision is grow, 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 like Amazon didn't have profit for 20 years, but wow, they were successful. But if they had a profit sharing plan, nobody wanted any of the profit because they knew there was not going to be any profit. But what they had was a phantom stock agreement, right? So they were able to attract and retain 
and remunerate a seasoned executives based on the size of the company they were building and the economic value of what they were building with either stock or with phantom stock. So there, it's it's more thinking about your business that way and thinking about how do you align. Okay. Um, what is the, when, I mean, you work with COOs on a, on a regular basis. What do you find to be the biggest struggle that the COO themselves have that they need to, they need help getting coached through or working, working around, uh, you know, what, what is the challenge that they have when they're working within the organization? And it's funny, this is almost, I shouldn't say it's every COO, but the most common thing that COOs or second in commands have to work on, and this is consistent all the way up to when I was coaching the CEO and the COO at Sprint. You know, I was coaching the COO for 18 months. His base salary was 2.7 million a year. I mean, he was paid very well, you know, and the CEO was running the 82nd largest company in the United States. Um, the biggest issue that they had was time to stay in sync, to have healthy conflict, to have good good communication about, about the business and issues without the rest of the team around, almost like a husband and wife in a traditional marriage where they need time away from the kids. They need to have date night. They need to have healthy conflict. They need to talk about their goals together. Otherwise they grow apart or otherwise they don't talk about the real shit. That's one thing that is very common regardless of the size is they need to have time for just them and the CEO to stay on the same page, to get in sync, to have good, healthy discussions, to have the emperor, you know, uh, new clothes discussions where, hey, you're naked and nobody's willing to tell you uh, and to do it in a safe place. And then also to just reconnect and have fun together and, and like each other. That's probably the most common thing that I see. Yeah, I love that. And, um, it, you know, it, it's interesting because you you equate it to a husband wife relationship, and um, it it does it does become interesting when when uh, especially if like one is male and one is female, and then you're they're they're spending so much time together, and it's like and you, people start to wonder like what, what's going on here. Um, I I uh, even look at at one of my mentors and and uh, you know how close he is with his COO, and uh, it's true like that you really need to have that kind of relationship to to get things done and to and to um to to put on those rocket boosters for your company like the when you're in sync that's when that's when the magic happens uh so you got to figure out the right formula to to make that work yeah and, and again it's critical if we don't actually set the time in our calendar to be able to have those discussions i remember when i was um starting up the franchising group for what's now Gerber Auto Collision in the US. It was called Boyd Auto Body at the time in Canada. And I talked to the CEO and I said, I need to have a one hour meeting with you or a 30 minute meeting with you every week at fixed time. And he's like, I don't need that. I'm like, no, no, it's not about you. I need it. Like I need time with you for you and I to stay in sync, for me to bounce ideas off you, for you to hold me accountable, for us to give each other shit on stuff, for us just to hang out and find it, for me to figure out where we're going that I, I need that time, right? So I had to ask for what was important to me. And um, yeah, I equate, I equate a lot of it, of, of it to, to a marriage. You know, you, I need time away from the kids, right? I need time away from the rest of the leadership team to just talk, right? I need time to have fun and reconnect so I like you and so that you like me so that we enjoy working together and so that it's not just work. Because at the end of the day, none of this shit actually matters. Right. This is just what we do to make money, regardless of what business we're in. We're all going to die. Yeah. So we may as well have some fun along the way, too. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And and uh, figure out figure out how to enjoy that journey. Um, all right. So, Cameron, we're we're just about out of time. We're going to wrap things up in, in just a moment. But is there anything that I should have asked you that we didn't cover that you feel is important to share in this conversation? One one that's interesting is is around, you know, we talked about how do we know what to look for, but the next part is where do you find them, right? So where do we find a good COO? The reality is no good second in command is out looking for a job today. They already have a job. They're already working for a pretty good firm. They're already pretty focused and pretty engaged. Your job is to poach them and entice them into something better, which means your opportunity needs to look better. Your vivid vision has to entice them. Your physical space has to excite them. 
the roles and responsibilities have got to intrigue them. We, you have to look at ways to, to pull them away and you probably don't know where they are. You know, I remember when, when John Barry from Barry Law was hiring a second in command, I introduced him to a search firm that helped him go and poach a very strong, very seasoned second in command. And I thought it was never going to happen because John's very type A, very driven. He's like, look, the guy's got to have good medium sized law firm experience. He needs to have been in operations for the law firm. He needs to be a lawyer and he needs to have military background. I'm like, John, it's not going to happen. Like, sorry, you're not going to find military background and law and be able to, to hang with you at the like type A level. Well, this search firm went and found the guy, like literally former military, former COO, mid-sized company, total baller, you know, works out in the gym just as hard as John does. Very different personality profile, but man, do they ever get along really well. So the key there is to engage a good search firm. If you don't know where to go, drop me an email. I can introduce you to the same group that helped them, but find a search firm that can help you poach a really good person because great people are not out looking for jobs. Yeah, I love that. And um, I appreciate you circling back to that because it was a question that I had uh, just didn't ask. So um glad, glad that we, we got that covered here. Um, and, and, you know, as much as I, I hate the idea of poaching somebody, it's so true. Like the, the, the really good people are always employed. It's not, you know, they're very, very rarely looking for a job. Um, and the other thing that I, that I know is like when you're, when you're interviewing somebody type a, uh, or level a people, um, interview the, the employer, more than the employer interviews them. So well, if, when you're type, type A people want to be grilled, they want to be stress tested, which means you better show up prepped. You better show up knowing now how to do an interview. It's one of the one of the 12 modules in my invest in your leaders course is the interviewing module. Like if you've never been trained on how to do interviews, like you've been trained on how to be a lawyer, you better learn how to do interviews. Because you need to grill these top people and make them sweat and make them sell you on the job. If you're sitting selling them all the time, you're going to turn them off and turn them away, right? It's almost like you need to reverse psychology, interview them to get them excited to come and join you. And then, yes, your business needs to look and feel the part to entice them over to what they and also sell them on what they get to build, not what you have today. Yeah, I love that. Like sell them on your vision and not on what your accomplishments yeah. All right, Cameron, we're going to wrap things up. So when I close out a show, um, I ask two things. The first is, can you leave uh, leave our audience with one parting piece of wisdom uh, that you'd like to share with them? And the second is, how do they find out more, get more information about working with you or learning from you? Uh, what's the next step that they can take if they really were intrigued by this topic or by you as, you know, as an individual? Yeah, I, I think one parting piece of wisdom I would say is that I think often entrepreneurs are very good at growing their skills, right? We're going to read books. We're going to listen to podcasts. We're going to watch videos. We're going to attend mastermind communities. Maybe you're join groups. That's all great stuff, but that's only going to get you 10% of the way. The real growth comes from investing in your leaders, right? The real growth comes from growing your people. If you can grow the skills of all of your key employees and your emerging leaders, they're going to grow the company for you. So it's really focusing on on the sum of the parts, right? Yeah, I, I love that. And man, as you're saying it, I'm like, wow, this is going to be an awesome YouTube short. <laughs> this one, this one piece of information because we don't think of it that way. Like we think that we're the thing that like we need to learn everything, we need to know everything, and we're always we're always trying to figure things out ourselves. But we can just put somebody in that role and have them do it. And you okay. know, there are people out there who already know already know how to you know how to get things done. Yeah, um, was, was man, that is much easier. Through. Sorry, and and that's much easier than than you trying to figure it out. Yeah. I was coaching a company years ago and I coached them from 40 employees up to about 400 employees. And I taught the CEO one of the modules from my invest in your leaders course. And he goes, that's going to change my company. I'm like, no, that's going to change you. But what's going to change your company is teaching that to the 36 or 45 other leaders in the company that manage people grow them. Right. And that's, that's a huge, huge, huge opportunity for us. Awesome. All right. And how do we uh, find out more about you? Take the next step. Sure. Well, all of my books, The Second in Command, I've actually written six books. All of my books are available on Amazon, Audible, and iTunes. Definitely check out The Second in Command podcast. And then I've also mentioned the Invest in Your Leaders course. It's called investinyourleaders.com. 
And then if your firm is already over uh, 5 million in revenue, definitely get whoever is your second in command into the COO Alliance for sure. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing with us so openly, Cameron. Great conversation. Really appreciate you being here today. Folks, if you enjoyed this episode, first of all, we're going to link all of those things that Cameron just shared in the show notes. You can find them right below the podcast that's playing in the description or on our website at profitwithlaw.com. Uh, and uh, mentioned YouTube shorts before. Uh, we have a YouTube channel. We just started this past March uh, and it is growing very, very quickly. We have uh, a number of videos up there. We put up uh, videos that are also outside of the podcast. Uh, so really good stuff going on there. Check it out at profitwithlaw.com forward slash YouTube. And if you're not subscribed to this show, make sure to hit the subscribe button so you get notified every time we release a new episode, which is at least once a week. As a matter of fact, the time I'm recording this, um, it'll already be old news by the time you listen to this, but we just crossed 200,000 downloads here on the podcast. It's a major milestone for us. We're celebrating here at Profit With Law, and we couldn't do it without you. So uh, you can help us double that very quickly by simply taking an episode like this where there is just so much value and just sharing it with a friend, somebody who's running a law firm, uh, you're checking in with them, you guys are comparing notes, you're having conversations, share this episode with them because it's going to help somebody uh, grow their business, move the needle forward and and really uh, put some, some rocket fuel uh, on their growth by getting the right person in the right seat um, at the right time, doing the right things. And we've talked about all of that today. So uh, stay tuned. We'll be back next week. Thank you very much for listening. And we will catch you next Thursday. Take care.